So thank you uh, and good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for coming here today. Uh, I'll just say a little bit about the, the, this talk. It's a talk I gave in a longer form, about an hour long, to a seminar series we have here called the Math Mathematics and Physics Seminar Series. And uh, I'm delighted now to actually address it to its, its true intended audience, which are physics teachers. So, uh, and I'll also stress, because I'm in electronic engineering, uh, within electronic engineering, we have a great need for, <coughs> for students with physics and, of course, mathematical abilities. So if you have such students, uh, bear in mind that we have some excellent uh, electronic engineering courses here. Uh, OK, so I, I, I'll start and maybe try to put the tides in perspective a little bit. Here we see the world, and we'll just get an idea of the dimensions of the world. The diameter of the world is around close to 13,000 kilometers. <coughs> so uh, from there to there, 13,000 kilometers. Now, the atmosphere is maybe between 30 and 100 kilometers, depending on how you choose to define it. But the tides are of the order of, here we see that the tides for Dumour East for, for the coming week. That's for Monday and the following Tuesday. And so we see the tides are, we have two tides a day, two highs, two, two lows, and they're of the order of fi five meters here is what we're seeing. They could be larger in various parts of the country, or parts of the world. So they're of the order of, of, of uh, meters to tens of meters. Uh, so we're going to zoom in and scale a little bit now and see where it takes us. So we're, we're in Ireland and we're zooming down and we're actually zooming into West Cork. For any, anyone here from Cork? I'm arriving at Cape Clear and in this little bay, there's a nice, uh, a nice cove and we can see there the, the seaweed of the high water mark. I remember talking to an individual, a man in this, uh, who, who was living here, telling me that uh, the tide was exceptional this year because all the planets were aligned. So now this was 10 years ago and maybe we weren't all used to hearing grown men making uh, grand and, and, and unjustified statements or, <laughs> yeah. So, so this made me pause for thought and, and I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't think it was right, but I wanted, wanted to know how... I, first of all, I don't, think I, was, I don't recall being taught in school whether the plants were involved, uh, and I wanted a framework where I, whereby, I wish, uh, whereby I could assess whether this was true or not. So I set to think about it, and uh, so the, the, the questions then that, I, that I, I kind of wanted to answer was, well, why do the moon and the sun both influence tides? This is what I started thinking about. And why, particularly, is the lunar influence bigger than the solar? And if we could come up with some metric by which we could assess the, 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 the influence, the, the tidal influence of any celestial body, we could then get a coherent picture for, for clearly knowing whether, this is, whether the, the planets affect the tides significantly or not. But of course, to do that, we have to, we have to actually address some more, some more basic questions like, why are there tides in the first place? And then why are there twi tides twice daily as opposed to just once daily? So most people's answer to this will be it's, it's to do with the moon. Yeah, and if we know a bit more, maybe the moon and the sun. But even if we address the question, why is the moon more important than the sun? So I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking a lot of the talk we just heard. Uh, if we're thinking, uh, how, do we, how do we try to... Uh, address why the moon has a bigger influence than the sun. Some people will say, well, the moon is nearer. Well, it is nearer, and that does play a role. But I'm, I'm not convinced that that alone is enough to, to, to help us answer the question. Uh, so I'm going to kick off by letting us look at the solar system. And we'll note some features of the solar system. We see the inner planets are obviously in a shorter route than the outer planets. But moreover, they're also going faster. So we see Saturn and Jupiter on a slow route here, and the inner planets going quite quickly. Now, this can be, this can be understood in the following way. We can, we can say at any distance from the sun, there's a velocity that we have to be going, the orbital velocity. And if we're going at that velocity, we'll stay in orbit. And so there is a, there is a velocity which depends on how far away we are from, from the sun. And if we're in that, we're in orbit. But if we go too slowly, we will spiral in. If we go too quickly, we will escape the sun. So as we see, the velocity is higher the closer you get. Venus is going fast. The Earth is going slower. And uh, we have this possibility of, going, of spiraling or escaping. Now, if we look at what the Earth is doing in this context, and I'm going to treat the solar tide, because the solar tide is actually the easiest one to, 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 to think about. 
So in the solar tide, the, the Earth is going at the velocity which is appropriate for the, for the center of the Earth. Whoops, for the center of the Earth. But the problem is all the Earth's going at the same velocity. And this part here is actually then going too slow. So it has a tendency to spiral in. On the other side, the velocity here is too, is too fast for that distance. So it has a tendency to go the other way. So that's how we get two tidal bulges. OK, so that's, our, that's, that's basically how I would explain why we see a tide at all. Now, the moon, of course, is the one we, we, we think is the most significant player. And it is the most significant player. But the nature of the effect is exactly the same. Because the sun and the earth are in a gravitational dance, and the moon and the earth are also in a gravitational dance. So we can take the same analysis. So having established what's, what we think is causing the tides, we then uh, would like to quantify this in some way. So I've tried to show you that there's a, there's a, that there's a velocity that would, is the, the kind of, that's the correct velocity to stay in orbit. But we can look at it another way. We can say there's a force here. And that's the correct force to stay in orbit, that gravitational force. But here, there's a slightly bigger force because we're closer. On the other side, there's a slightly less force because we're further away. So that's another way of looking at it, not just addressing it in terms of velocity. We can see it in terms of force. And that's how we can, <coughs> we can address to try to quantify, to try to quantify the, uh, the, the, the nature of the tidal effect. So what we're looking for then is this delta force, this change in the gravity, the fact that we see a slightly different gravity on either side of the Earth. And we can do so by thinking, OK, well, there is the, 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 the center distance. We think about a delta D on this side and, and a, the, the minus delta D on this side, the same reduction of small extra distance. And what we can do is we can plug those into Newton's law of gravity and see what happens and see what we can get. See if we can get some analysis out of it. OK. So, so bef before, we, uh, before we, we get to think about that, I'd ask us to make some observations. And we're, trying, we're saying the moon and the sun both uh, influence the tide. Well, what can we say about them? The sun is a big thing far away, and the moon, we might say, is a small thing nearby. And yet they both seem to have this comparable tidal effect. We might say that the moon is roughly, it's, just, it's more than twice that of the sun. Those are things that, 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 that we uh, believe to be true. So let's see. Uh, what observation we can make. Well, what do the moon and the sun both have in common? Well, what they have in common is they both have the same apparent size. They, they, when we look up at them, they appear to be the same size. And uh, this is borne out clearly by an eclipse when the, the moon covers the sun. And this can only happen because they are, it's only happen as elegantly as that because they are effectively the same size. So we need to try to think about how we quantify uh, this, this idea of apparent size. And what exactly do we mean by apparent size? So there's, 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 a, there's this. What's actually happening is the one at the front is a, uh, it's a toy car. So that's the, those, those are the real sizes. And in this image, these have the same apparent size. So the first thing we say is to, to, to know about apparent size, we need to not only know how, actually, how big the thing actually is, but also how far away it is. And that's the problem with just saying, the moon is near, causing the bigger influence. Well, I mean, there are lots of nearer things than the moon, and they don't have a tide. There's more to it than just the, the proximity. There's the size of the object as well. And these two are borne out in the, the idea of apparent size. And uh, a nice way to express apparent size is to do it just through an angle. See, for a circular object, we don't have to talk about solid angle. We can just talk about a single, a single variable angle. We can say, because it's a, it's a spherical object, it will it'll have the same. Uh, angle in all directions. And our, our angle then can be approximated by the diameter of the object, by how far away it is. So that's my attempt to explain apparent size to you. And I hope that I have uh, been a little bit more successful than, than, than Father Ted was when he tried to explain the same thing to Dougal, if you recall. Uh, the last time, Dougal, these are small. But the ones out there are far away. Okay. So <laughs> now we, we, we have a, a sense of hope of what apparent size is. And, and notice diameter over the distance away. And I'm using big D there, uh, subscript B for the body in question. So let's 
take one approach. Let's, let's, uh, let's try to get the known figures. So we go to uh, Wikipedia and we look up the size of these objects and we see that the sun is actually 1.4 million kilometers in diameter, 150 million kilometers away. We cancel the millions and the kilometers and we get 1.4 over 150, which is about 1 over 110 in radians, because that's the natural angle when we, when we take this approach, which is around half a degree. We do the same for the moon, and as we, as we were hoping to see, and as we do see, we, we approximately get the, the, the same value, because we've got then three and a half over 384. So it's one part in 110 is a way of looking at it. Now, that's looking, up the, looking at, your, at your tables. It would be nice, though, if we could do, go about it another way. And one way you can go about it is if you make a pinhole projection of the sun so you, you get a piece of cardboard and you put a hole in it and you let the sun shine through it. And the nice thing here is that we see whatever angle, the angle is conserved there and there. So this means that if you have a pinhole projection and you're 1.1 meter away from the, the pinhole, the size of your sun will be around 1.1 centimeter. So this is how we can ourselves measure the angle, angular size of the sun. It's not so easy to measure the distance, nor is it so easy to go out there and measure, this, measure the sun itself. Uh, but we can measure its angular size because it's, it's, it's uh, <coughs> freely observable to us. Okay, so we can set up a pinhole camera to do that. Is that, that idea clear to everybody? Or would you like a demonstration of it with a, a lamp and a cardboard, a piece of cardboard? Yeah, yeah sure. will we do that? Okay, so here's my, my bit of cardboard and here's my lamp. And so hopefully all of you will be able to see, uh, uh, let me see, can we all see it there? There's my projection as I move further away, the image gets smaller. I could also, if I went equidistant, I would find that the image on the screen was the same size as my lamp. Okay, so that's what we can do. But there, there's also a, a nicer way to do it, and we get chances to do this, you know, if, what? Something up to your lights there? Did I do that? There's a timer. Oh, so we need the light, yeah, we need the dim lights. Thank you for giving. Okay, so this is, uh, this is before my dinner arrives uh, th this summer. And uh, I hope you can see that we see there's a whole lot of circles on my, uh, where my dinner plate is supposed to, is due to arrive. And uh, what they are, are they are pinhole projections of the sun above me, uh, of, of, uh, of the sun. And the restaurant in question was outdoors and there were trees and the trees were about two stories high or so. And if we think about the size of a fork, that's maybe 15, 20 centimeters. So those are around six, seven, eight centimeters in diameter. That tells me that the tree's around eight or nine meters in height, okay? So there's lots of opportunities to see this. And if you point it out to students, you can, you can, you can ask them to start seeing it. In a crack in a door as well, if you see a, a little a narrow gap in a door and the sun is shining through it, you'll see the angle spreading out in the further out where you are. You so you can measure, that. there's lots of ways you can measure the size of the sun, the apparent size, without going there. Because uh, that is not so easy. Okay, and on a, <coughs> on a literary note, uh, Joyce in Ulysses, he refers to these as dancing coins. So there's a nice little ending to one of his chapters. On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. So that's what he's talking about, these little dancing coins that you see through the leaves. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you the result first and then I'm going to give you the derivation. This is the result and it's that the tidal force depends on, depends on two things. The density of the, the, the body that we, we are thinking about, be it the moon or the sun or the planets, and the angular size of the body. And we've said what the angular size is. So let's see how this <coughs> plays out for the, the moon and the sun. Well. If what I'm saying is true, since the angular size of both is the same, we would expect that the density of the moon is going to be bigger than the sun. Now, the moon is a, is a solid, rocky place where the, where the sun, although it's enormous and you know, the seat of all the energy we get, the source of all the energy we get on Earth, it's actually made of plasma, isn't it? So it's not, its density is actually quite low, relatively speaking. So those are the densities of the moon and the sun. And so the first thing we can actually explain then is the, is the, uh, the values we're seeing here. Now, there's a nice coinc coincidence here. Those two densities, their density is relative to water. But if I add those two numbers together, I get, get 4.8, which coincidentally is around the size of the tide in Dunmore, or around here, roughly f five meters. So that's a nice coincidence. So on a first glance, we can then actually see next Monday, 
uh, we're around the, the, the full moon, I think, is, is around at the moment. And next Monday will actually be the, 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 the highest tide. And we can see 0 to 4.8 is, is the uh, expected tide under those circumstances. But just over a week later, we're seeing numbers of this order of magnitude. So you c those numbers are popping up from the relative densities of, th of the sun and the moon. So the reason the moon is more influential is because it's, it's, they're both the same apparent size and it's more dense. Okay, so that's our first little result from, from looking at, look, from using our, this formula here, that the, the tidal force basically depends on this. You want to think about the influence of any object, think about the density and the angular size. So that's the take home message. This is, this is what I want, this is, I'm going to give us a derivation at the end, but this is what I wanted to know. I wanted to have this in my head so I could think about the problem of, of, of tidal influence and say, okay, let me see how much do, will the planets affect the tides? Okay, so if it's, where did I move from there? Now, we can go to our, our Wikipedia table for the size of the planets, and we can see actually that when Venus and Jupiter are, as cl are closest to us, the maximum, the maximum angular size will be about 1 30th in the case of Venus and 1 40th the size of the moon and the sun. So that's the relative sizes of these planets relative to the moon. And these are some photographs I took when they were very close, which is about six years ago. And that's Venus and that's uh, Jupiter. Now, what you could do, you get, a, you get a ruler, go along there and measure that, and you can see that they are roughly those, those proportions. So we, are, we, can, we can verify ourselves by looking at these objects and taking photographs of them that they are around those sizes. So we, we, we proceed from there, and we then think, okay, well, the first thing that we can see is because Venus is only a 30th of the angular size and the angular size is in the cube, we're going to get a massive reduction in its influence. It's going to be 3 squared is 9, cubed is 27, and we're going to get three more zeros, and we get 1 over 27,000 for that. For Jupiter, we get 164,000. And for Mar Mars, I didn't take photographs of it, and, uh, but we, if we look up the sizes of, of that, we see it's what, about 100th the size of the Moon. Therefore, its influence, in terms of its angular size alone, is around a millionth of that of the Moon. We then add all these contributions together. So what I have here is my total tidal influence. I'm taking the principle that these are simple linear, uh, uh, linear processes that I can add them together and look at their influences uh, individually and add them. And so there I, I, I have the influence for each one along there, and I'm, I'm, I'm listing them in the order of Moon, Luna, Sol, Jupiter, Venus, Mars. Okay, so what do I do first? I say, well, I'll take this as my reference. I'm going to say that the, the, the Moon and the Sun our, our, uh, our, our, our unit, unit angle, and these are relative to that. So one appears in here. Those are my relative sizes as they appear. Then I put in my densities, Jupiter low density because it's a gas giant, and then I get this figure at the end here. And what can we then say from all that? Well, that basically, if we look back to our numbers, we can associate these with meters because we saw that the 3.4 and 1.4 meters led to the... Uh, led to our uh, total of 4.8. So now we look at what, what, what Venus is giving us. That's the biggest of all those. And Venus is 0.02 of a, of a, of a meter, so 0.2 of a millimeter, so literally a hair's breadth. So that's how we were able to show that that is what is expected. The derivation is straightforward enough. Uh, we start with Newton's law. We put in our delta, our, 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 our delta d, our, our small variation in distance, as I showed you there. i show you there. And, uh, and we arrive at this tidal force equation. And all we have to actually use is a simple linear approximation, which engineers such as myself are very fond of using all the time. It's a shortened form of a bigger series uh, that extends with x squared and so forth. But we're linear type of people. We want to know what's, what the linear effect is, first of all. OK, so there is the derivation. If you're standing there, Gabriel, does that mean I'm, I'm getting close to time? Or? OK, grand. OK, <laughs> that's perfect, perfect, perfect. OK, it'll only take a minute to do this, right? Uh, so we put in our delta D, we put in our delta D there, and we grab out the D squared to make it a little bit tidier, and then we multiply that out, we get rid of our second order term, now we have a nice 1 plus X there, I use my simple approximation, bring it up above the line. This term here then is the, the overall force, the delta is what I'm looking for, I'm left then with this, rearranging it, I see that there. I've done it there for what I calculus explicitly. It, it's by lo looking at the small differences. 
and then moving across here, let, look, what, what are these quantities? G is a constant, delta D, well, we take the maximum delta D on either side of the Earth. Uh, the mass of the Earth is one of the objects, so that doesn't matter. I now look at proportionalities. I put in the mass of the body in question, and I see this nice formula here. The tidal, uh, the tidal influence depends on the mass of the body and the distance cubed away from it. But the nice thing is that the, the mass we can express in terms of density by volume, and volume we can associate with diameter, diameter cubed, proportional to diameter cubed. And so we see that appearing, but that, of course, is our angle, angular size. And we get our required equation. And the nice thing is somebody, like somebody it's always nice when somebody agrees with you. <laughs> and it's even nicer when that person is Newton. So <laughs> since the force of the moon to move the sea is as the densities of the bodies of the moon and the sun and the cube of the parent diameter joint, jointly. So, so we're in agreement with, with, with uh, Newton. Thankfully, this, this, I got this published in, in, in the journal Physics Education, uh, published by the Institute of Physics, of course. And there's a, in, in the time on a tradition of, of, of talks and presentations, there's one for everyone in the audience. I got uh, copy, copyright permission for that. Uh, I did say in the talk that I would talk about the likely causes of, of, of tides, and here they are. Uh, they are when th the likely causes of extreme tides, as opposed to thinking it's to do with the planets, is, that, is when, when the, the moon and the sun are closest to the Earth, because they're in elliptic orbit, so that's going to have a variation. At equinox, we get a pronounced effect as well, which I, 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 is outlined in the paper. And of course, weather is going to affect it. On the long game, it is true that the planets can alter the orbits of the moon and the Earth. So we could say that in some sense, they do affect the tides, because they alter the positions of the moon and the Earth. But that's not in human time scales. And I'm nearly there, Gabriel. I want to thank everybody, including yourself, and Paul for organizing. And I actually particularly want to thank the man on Cape Clear, <laughs> whose statement got me thinking. And uh, I would also put in the disclaimer, though he was on Cape Clear, I can uh, assure you he was not a native of County Cork. <laughs> OK, so thank you very much. <laughs>